Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinemdy.com slash podcast and get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome back on the show, Nicola DePaul. She is a clinical psychologist and a health systems leadership consultant. Her Kevin MD article, which we'll talk about today, is titled, Leaders Who Elevate Diverse Employees Create Psychological Safety. Nicola, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. So for those who didn't listen to our first episode together a couple months ago, just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Yeah, so I'm a clinical psychologist and I specialize in primary care. So I've actually been working in primary care clinics as a psychologist or as a clinician for about 13 years. And in my graduate work, I focused on organizational well-being and employees. So I've always kind of had two interests, but they come together really well in my interest in primary care. So I've spent most of my career doing clinical work and coaching and consulting with primary care department leadership teams to help them really refocus on how do we take care of employees? How do we create better patient outcomes? And from my perspective and my work, that really starts with the employee window. So that's kind of my big picture. And then uh, things got very personal for me when I experienced burnout a few years ago and had a baby right, you know, a couple of years before mm -hmm. the pandemic, changed healthcare systems and started to see how leaders were struggling in healthcare systems I was less familiar with. So I became much more aware of some of the challenges that make psychological safety difficult, employee engagement, you know, that lead to kind of end stage burnout, which is turnover, people quitting and leaving. So I got even more passionate about what I've always been interested in. And then I, I started my own podcast about a year ago to continue to really dive into those issues. Now, so, as you've shown the micro microscope on <clears throat> the systems themselves, and you start talking to clinical leaders within healthcare organizations, what are some of the surprising things that you discovered? Oh, man, great question. You know, I think the surprising thing to me is always how much leaders can do when so much feels out of their control. Because when I get invited in, it's usually when things are not going well, you know, their numbers or their metrics look really bad and they, they've had a lot of turnover or they have a lot of employees complaining about burnout. And so I think it's easy for leaders to get caught up and I can get caught up in this too, in seeing the big like, national political challenges impacting healthcare or, you know, payer reimbursement rates impacting healthcare. But when we really dig into things, there's always so much more that the teams can actually do mm. to take better care of their people and to make a really substantial difference that goes way beyond lip service. So I think that's my big surprise. And I continue to get surprised by that because I, I get pulled into that myth that you can't do anything and then work with these teams and see over and over again, actually, you can do so much and their people are so grateful by the end of the process. Now, we always talk about how bad burnout is, how much how much turnover there is in the system. Now, you've been doing this for, for many years now. Have you seen the needle moved? Have you seen any improvement over the years that you've been doing this? Honestly, no, it's gotten worse. Mm. I'm, I mean, I'm really sad to say that, but I mean, based on, I guess my observation isn't, it's just purely anecdotal, but the data, you know, what people actually research and find out is, is that burnout has increased. And I think for physicians, it's, it's gone from like 40% to into the sixties and for nurses, you know, maybe in the sixties to like 90% of people endorsing at least one burnout symptom. And then turnover has also increased pretty dramatically just in the past couple of years, which seems to be at least partially related to the extra stress of COVID. So I think pre COVID typical turnover rate for a healthcare system was about 20%. Mm -hmm. And now the typical rate is closer to 25 and it's definitely higher in certain professions where people are much more stressed. Unfortunately, primary care is also one of those areas where people tend to be more stressed and, and turnover can be high. All right, let's uh, shift over and talk about one aspect of, of that. And it's titled leaders who elevate diverse employees create psychological safety. Now, tell us, how did this article come together? So this is based on my personal experience. I switched healthcare systems and I've been a training faculty for 
you know, medical training programs pretty much since I finished my own doctoral program. And I've been pretty used to training programs that treat their, their employees or their residents as whole people and who are at least thoughtful about engaging them as employees, thinking about their perspectives. I switched to a new program and they just didn't seem to have a, an understanding of why that would matter. So I, I walked into this program and it became pretty clear that trainees were really unhappy. And a big piece of that was that they didn't feel safe because they didn't feel valued or respected and weren't having their perspectives listened to. And so for me, as I started to look a little bit deeper, I, I also noticed that the staff, the faculty seemed to have similar experiences and you could really see the dissatisfaction and the lack of safety in faculty meetings, which just had a very unpleasant kind of not conflict, but just people clearly didn't feel safe speaking their mind. Mm. And there was a lot of backbiting when people weren't present. So yeah, kind so what, of a, was, what was that like? So what would you see that, that made you, made you think that? So like one of the things ooh, that this particular system was doing was sending trainees out of the conversation. So they would bring them in for a brief period of time and then have them leave and then discuss every trainee's performance, which isn't completely unusual, but the discussions were, were much more negative and much less focused on professional development or supporting the person. And then information seemed to be getting back to trainees in a pretty backwards or roundabout way. So to me, that just seemed like the whole system was not able to communicate openly, effectively, and safely. And when you talk to the trainees themselves, what exactly did they tell you? Or were these written on surveys that give, gave you the sense of their dissatisfaction? Yeah. So I was one of their group supervisors. So there, we had a number of conversations about this, but they were sharing things like they were worried about being kicked out of the program. They were worrying that they were going to be failed. They weren't sure what messages were going home to their home institution. They were hearing complaints about themselves from people who had no supervisory authority over them. So they, they just sort of felt talked about and judged and they were really uncomfortable. And one of the trainees ultimately decided to place a complaint to the accrediting body because, you know, they were just so unhappy and she felt like some of the things that had happened to her in particular had been unethical. I'm going to have you tell the rest of the story, but before we do, you use the term psychological safety just to make sure that we're all on the same page. What exactly is that? So that's the ability to have like emotional safety within a group of people. So basically you're able to have a difficult conversation, maybe give or receive difficult feedback, talk about tough subjects and have the other people in the room listen to you without shaming you or judging you. So psychological safety is not the freedom to say anything that is on your mind or to be cruel to other people. It's really the ability to bring openness to tough conversations and to create innovative ideas and also to disclose your own failures, mistakes, or talk about mistakes as a team. All right. So tell us what happened next with this program. So what I did was over a period of a few months, worked with the trainees and talked with them about, well, what, what can you do to advocate for yourselves? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, went so far. And then ultimately I decided, okay, I need to advocate for the trainees and really step into what's happening in this program. So I invited the, the top people in the, in the training program and the department director to sit down with me. And I, I gave them very direct feedback about what I had observed and what I had heard from the trainees. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they were not very open to the feedback at the time and basically just told me I was going crazy and, and not seeing things that were reality-based. So they were very, very defensive. Did they just stonewall you? Did they actually react in a defensive way when you gave them this feedback? Um, I mean, they were polite, but they, they basically said, you know, we really, we appreciate you coming to us, but we're, we're really sorry to see that you have this really odd totally off base perspective. Mm. So they, they weren't able to hear the feedback then, but just shortly afterwards, one of the trainees had made the complaint. So it, it actually got investigated. So then ultimately they, they did come back and they were willing to have a more productive conversation. And the good news is that they actually made a number of programmatic changes that dramatically changed the culture of the whole program and for all the faculty. And I thought it was really powerful 
that their policy changes, just a different approach to how some of these conversations happened, how they managed some of these training situations had such an impact because they didn't take the time to really, you know, build the psychological safety or talk about it with their people. But even though they didn't do that, those, the, the policy changes really had profound impacts. Sure. What kind of changes did they make? What are some examples? Yeah. So one of the things that they did was they actually started including trainees in the whole meeting Hmm. and they separated out any conversation about trainees so that it was only super like direct supervisors who were present for those conversations. And then feedback had to be provided to the trainee in writing like in advance of a faculty meeting, if it was significant and negative. So it really closed the loop on communication. It made it dramatically more helpful for the trainee and the feedback became much more focused on like productive, constructive growth and helping trainees to grow in those areas where they may have been having challenges. So there was no longer any opportunity for like the gossip backbiting experience and trainees began to report that they felt dramatically safer and much happier in the training system. Do you have any insight in terms of what that turning point was when it came to leadership making that reflective change? Was it the complaint? Did they just have time to think about your feedback and decide to implement those changes? Any insight in terms of what made that change? I think that it was probably a combination I definitely think that the complaint was the catalyst for the change, but I do think that, you know, persistence of both myself and the trainees in terms of giving feedback was part of that. So what I didn't mention earlier was that, you know, I obviously talked with them a couple of times. The trainees also approached the leadership team, which was very valiant of of people with very little power in the system. So I think having multiple points of feedback that were consistent over a fairly prolonged period of time was a big piece of that. And I do see that as being a a big piece in helping leadership change and, and understand what faculty, staff, trainees are experiencing. You know, when you persistently share the same message, ultimately they are more able to get to a place where they can let go of their defensiveness and be more receptive or self-reflective and actually hear what's going on so that they can make those changes. You mentioned that the trainees brought their concerns to administration and that's not always the case because of that power differential. Now, is this something that you had to guide them with? Is this something that they came up by themselves? Because from what I hear, that's, that's not typically the case or that's not often the case. Yeah. So I definitely provided guidance in that. And I actually provide a training to all of the trainees that I work with, Mm -hmm. which is focused on how to give difficult feedback to people with more power than you have. So it's one of the first things that we work on together and we really work on the skill. And then I do follow up with them to help them apply it because it's, it's actually very common for trainees to have difficult experiences with supervisors or faculty who aren't direct supervisors, but have some power over them, or of course the leadership of their program. So what we really do is work on the skill of how do you take care of yourself in the midst of this you know, scary experience? And then how do you go to leadership or your supervisor and make a connection based on your shared values? So this is not basing it on blame, but shared values, what you both find important and in common? And then how do you share your perspective in a way that is more likely to be heard and understood? So, and I'm not trying to say like, say it in a nice way, that's just going to make the person feel good, but like sharing, you know, your experience in the a less defensive way and trying to get as collaborative as possible. And then, you know, staying with it to help move towards change, which does take a really long time, but I I think it is empowering for these trainees for sure. I think that's a tremendously important point. And I would love to be in that room for the conversation like that in terms of reaching out to one's superiors in terms of bring feedback. So tell us, an example of, of such a conversation, you know, this could be a whole other podcast topic, I'm sure, but just give us an example of how that power differential, how that 
person lower down in a power scale can bring some of some of that feedback because this isn't an uncommon situation and not only residents and physicians in training but new attendings and this is something that i read commonly oh absolutely so i'm thinking of one of my former trainees who is a korean american woman and who was in a i think it was a didactic on diversity actually and the person who was leading the conversation made some comment that was unintentionally quite derogatory towards asian women and it made my trainee very uncomfortable. I think she tried to speak up in the moment and was just kind of shut down with a defensive reaction and then paused and wasn't quite sure what to do next. And so she came to me and we really talked through the situation. And then she actually ended up scheduling a meeting with the person who was leading the didactic conversation and was able to have like a full conversation about why the comment had been really painful for her and why it was essentially a microaggression. And then, you know, they got to a point where they were able to talk about what would be a more appropriate alternative or way to have that conversation in the future. So even the per though the person wasn't um, responsive in that moment when it was happening, she was willing to go back, which I think a lot of trainees, of course, would find pretty scary, especially when they're being evaluated. But she went back, she had that conversation and they ended up being very open to the conversation. And I think just had been blind to that particular element and why the comment was so hurtful to her. But for her, I, I think she ended up feeling quite empowered because she improved her relationship with this faculty member. And she had that opportunity to share her truth and then be her full self throughout the rest of the training year. And I think for her, it would have been harmful if she hadn't been able to speak up because mm -hmm. that is such a huge piece of who she was. It's a part of her identity she can't hide and doesn't want to hide. So being able to fit, take full ownership of that was really powerful. Tell us some red flags, things that trainees should not do when giving difficult feedback to their superiors. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it is easy to give feedback in a blaming way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do this myself. We're all human. So when you get caught up in saying, well, you did this, you know, anything that starts with you or, you know, you made me, it's really common language that we use, but any of that kind of language is going to be a real red flag. I think also speaking from a place where you are so distressed that you're not able to take care of yourself can be harmful. And you might feel internal pressure and really need to speak up and advocate for yourself. But in that moment, when you're so distressed, it just may not be the time because you may say something that you regret or say something that discloses more than you intend to disclose. So taking a little bit of extra time to calm yourself can be really valuable. I think it can also, it can be really tricky because I think most faculty really do want to be helpful mm -hmm. and have a trainee's best interest in mind, but are not always effective at acting in those ways. Can't do that independently. But it, it can be tempting to sort of villainize the other person and not see their good intention, especially when their behaviors are pretty egregious. And of course, there are people who are truly malicious, and that I think is different. But when the person really does have trainees' best interests in mind, wants to be helpful, and has made, you know, maybe more than an honest mistake, needs feedback, going into the conversation with the best of intentions is going to get you so much farther. Mm -hmm. So when you see, no way of being on the same page. Like, you're just never going to be able to get to the point of collaboration. So let me ask that from another perspective, from a leadership standpoint, what are red flags they shouldn't do when they want to create psychological safety? Oh, I, I guess in some ways, similar things. So leaders are often very tempted to talk way too much. Hmm. So leaders need to just be quiet, sit on their hands if they have to, 
to listen, <laughs> like stop, hear the other person. And leaders also can sometimes be tempted to listen to just the loudest voices, mm -hmm. which in some systems means that that person has more power or more inherent psychological safety. So it can be easy for leaders to miss the people whose voices are quieter or simply not heard. So like the people with the least amount of power in the room and whatever diversity characteristic or historical marginalization or simply personality factors contributing to that. So leaders really have to pay attention to their own bias and to who they're naturally paying attention to and let that go or really keep that in check so that they can hear from a broader variety of their, their people, their employees. We're talking to Nicola DePaul. She is a clinical psychologist and health systems leadership consultant. Her Kevin MD article is titled Leaders Who Elevate Diverse Employees Create Psychological Safety. Nicola, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. So I really want both leaders and clinicians to remember that you have a lot more power in these situations than you think. And that goes beyond just speaking up. But, and you may need to speak up and that's a critical part of creating change, but you can also be thinking about who can I empower in this situation and whose voice is being missed. And then what are those messages that I can like advocate up or lift up, elevate into my leadership so that those perspectives are not missed and that there's more safety created within the system. Nicola, thank you so much for sharing again, your time and insight. Thanks again for coming back on the show. Oh, such a pleasure. Thanks for having me.